Hello and welcome to Leveraging Microsoft's Capabilities in Your Legal Technology Roadmap. We invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your speaker for today, Kristen Graber, Business Solutions Analyst. Kristen, you now have the floor. Thank you, Jennifer, and good morning or good afternoon to all of the folks that have chosen to participate today. I'd like you to welcome, or I'd like to welcome you to today's ILTA webinar, How to Leverage Microsoft's Capabilities in Your Legal Technology Roadmap. In the, for the beginning part of this, what I'd like to do is give you a little background about who I am and who MicroStrategies is, also talk a little bit about the offerings that we have, and finally, how can we take whatever part of the roadmap that we're currently on using Microsoft technology and move forward to the 21st century. From a company perspective, MicroStrategies was established in 1983, and we have about 140 professionals, including programming folks, technical staff, engineering and design folks, as well as in-house legal subject matter experts who understand the business of law. We've been working with many law firms, be they sole practitioners or international uh, AM100 firms, and we have a significant presence also in the corporate legal uh, side of the house. So for some of the major corporations here in the New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Philadelphia areas, we tend to work in their corporate legal departments as well. We have solution centers both for the Microsoft Experience Center, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment, as well as the premier IBM Business Partner Innovation Center. What that means actually in English is that we are fully capable of standing up a full proof of concept for your legal or other staff so you could see how it would work in your environment using your data. And we're able to do that either in our New Jersey or our Philadelphia metro area. So as I'm sure you can imagine, we tend to cover the Atlantic seaboard pretty well when it comes to legal as well as corporate legal uh, content management solutions. With respect to that, MSI has been dedicated to expanding our presence in the legal market with respect to our in-house legal subject matter experts. I am, many, I am one of many folks here who have been working in the legal industry with a combined experience level of 40 plus years. So we know the business of legal. Our clients, like I alluded to before, range from corporate legal departments to private practice law firms. And those private practice law firms can be smaller sole practitioners or can be a multinational client. Finally, let's talk about our solutions. We are a comprehensive end-to-end -end solutions provider, which means that we not only know the business in this case of law, but we are also able to provide all of your infrastructure needs from servers to off-prem cloud solutions for things like SQL or Exchange. The best part is that because we're able to work with a variety of partners, we can provide the best solution for you meaning that we can go and make a solution from all of the different best-in-class parts to make it work for your firm or your corporation. Just a small uh, sampling, if you will, of our different corporate uh, partnerships. We have Microsoft. We also are partners with Autonomy, Workshare, Alfresco, and IBM. Other interesting notations on this particular slide are our BPIC and Microsoft Experience Centers, both available in our Philadelphia and New York offices. And also, we have Tech Biz Learning, which enable IT professionals to come in and learn specifics around Microsoft or IBM technologies. Finally, I would like to talk a little bit about what the legal engagement offerings are. Now, these can come as a full set. For example, if we come on site and are engaged to do a full solution for perhaps your document management on SharePoint. However, maybe you'd like to have all the partners who have part of your technology committee come in and see what it might look like. We can do that in either of our offices in our Microsoft Envisioning Center. We can also help find out your current state assessment, 
and make recommendations for technologies that would work specifically for you and your business users by coming in and doing business requirements documents. Finally, we can take that information we've learned from those users and build a customized design for you based on the architecture that you'd like to use or the solution set. We can run a proof of concept right then and there for you to be sure that it meets all of your business needs from a technical as well as a business perspective. We can provide those infrastructure not only advice but also design and we can also bring in the hardware for you, everything from servers to cloud solutions. We can all understand that when it comes to a new solution, migrating to that solution, getting all of your users and your users' documents into the proper matter, folder, or workspace can be daunting. Also, teaching sometimes legal users to use the solution from an acceptance perspective can be quite difficult as well. So we've built a, sub a support and training methodology to be sure that we go ahead and make sure that the solution that you've spent the amount of time and resources on creating is actually used by your users. So with that being said, what I'd like to do next is demonstrate some of those pieces of technology based on how we work with the system as legal users. I'd like to also, before I get started, offer you an opportunity, if you are joining us at ILTA in August, to please come over to booth 1128 and talk to me about any of the things that you've seen today. And finally, we are most happy to hook you up with your very own Microsoft Experience Center session. Just for your firm on whatever time frame works for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly or to go ahead and email us at legal at microstrat.com. So with all that being said, and thank you so much for sitting through my introductory presentation, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about how we can go ahead and work with the products in the Microsoft Suite. Because I realize that not all of us are coming from the same place, and we'd like to think of Microsoft as helping us with our roadmap, especially in the legal vertical. And why is it a roadmap? Because some of us might not be coming from the same place. Just like we all know we can get to Disneyland, uh, in California from Idaho or from New Jersey, we can get to where we would like to be in the 21st century at our firm in a variety of different ways as well. For example, maybe we are still on Office 2003 and we know that Word is the gold standard of word processing, especially in the legal community. And as we know, because we have special needs for our documents, we have special requirements for those particular programs. So how is it that if we have so many highly customized pieces, if you will, that click on top of or are add-ins to Word or Outlook, how can we go ahead and move to Office 2010? Great question. So maybe it's also we've already moved over to Office 2010 and we'd like some great ways to make it worth more for our users. Maybe you get many, many, many help desk calls that goes something like, ring, ring, I can't find my insert section break. And as we know, as seasoned users, that in 2003, some of our commands were much easier to find than they are in 2007 or 2010. But 2010 brings us to another kind of way to be able to standardize the look and feel of Microsoft technologies for our users. For example, we know when we come in in the morning, we went ahead we opened up our Outlook. And most of us in legal, and pretty much I think in many industries, spend our hours in, in an Outlook. But that's really where the similarities end. As a legal user, the next place that I tend to spend most of my time is right here, here in Outlook. And then, depending on my role at the firm, it will be where do I go next. So let's just take a moment and imagine that I'm a legal secretary, and my attorney just asked me to go ahead and help him write a memo. No problem. The first thing I'd like you to note here across my toolbar area, and just for folks that are not familiar with the Office 2010 naming convention, this is called a ribbon. On my ribbon, I have many tabs. And you'll notice that I even have a special tab.
for Dwight and Harrison. Now, Dwight and Harrison is not a brand new AM100 firm. Dwight and Harrison is actually just a made-up name of a law firm that I wanted to use to show you how easy it would be to customize a ribbon button for your firm. For instance, you get that phone call at your user support desk, ring, ring, I can't find my section break. Now, one thing I will tell you is if section break were important to folks and your user community would want it to come over and use a very special tab that was created in the ribbon, that can be centrally created and managed as well as administered. So remember that from a back-in-the-day perspective of 2003, we had custom toolbars, we had to make sure the macros were there, we had to do a lot of different things behind the scenes to make sure that a memo, for example, in New York would look like a memo in LA. Now, if to start a memo, none of these little toolbar buttons across the top are going to help me out, but one will. And you'll notice across the bottom part of my ribbon that I have what's called a quick access toolbar. Now, in this particular case, you might have noticed that mine happened to take its cue from Plastic Man in the sense that it scoots all the way over to the right-hand side. And there might even be a new button that's under there that I can't see. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because the Quick Access Toolbar is another way that we can centrally manage and administer buttons and significant functions that your user community might be looking for that you're spending a lot of time having to educate them how to find it. So, a few ways that you can customize Microsoft Word for the legal community. Now, I said that my attorney had asked me to go ahead and help with the memo. To do that, I'm just going to go ahead, and in this case, because I have a button on my quick access toolbar to start a new document from a template, which is what we're talking about right now, standard templates for my firm, whether I'm in the New York litigation group or whether I'm in the Palo Alto IP group, it looks the same either way. So I'm going to go ahead, and in this case, I'm just going to simply choose memo. Again, these are centrally managed and administered. So, if it were that you wanted to go out and have different captions. For instance, in California, they still use pleading paper that has lines and numbers. Anyone in 2003, and I know this could be a real concern, trying to get those numbers to play nice with the, with the line numbers, especially in a, in a California pleading, can be difficult at best. One of the ways that you can make it easier for your users to be able to file a litigation in California is to create that template in advance for them. All they need to do is simply come right over and click, in that case, California Pleading. We're going to go ahead and click Memo and press OK. Now it's so nice that it will even actually start to ask me I'm gonna, what it is that I would like to put into my memo. So I'm going to go ahead. Now, of course, again, these are completely customizable, and they're just a few. I just want you to see what they look like. But as I'm sure you can imagine, for doing a caption, for doing a pleading, you could have the motion to what kind of pleading is this? Motion to dismiss. Are we the plaintiff or the defendant? So it takes a lot of the guesswork, even from a certification, is Mr. Joe James a he or a she for his certification, where things can be standardized and appear less sloppy, perhaps, to the court. So I'm going to go ahead and type in today's date. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and type in my ray line. This should just be our case status. Now, I know that that might seem like something that's easy to us IT professionals especially, but imagine the amount of time that I just saved a litigation professional helping them go ahead and create a standard memo that we know will look the right way from Dwight and Harrison no matter where we send it from. So in this case, let me go ahead and just pop some uh, information. And I'm going to go ahead to, oops, and I'm not a very good speller. One of the super nice things about Office 2010 is that when a misspelling, for example, comes up with a red underline, it will go ahead and try to help me out with its most, um, its best guess, which I think is usually pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and put in my certification is required. Now, again, I am just making things up. And I'm going to say we're going to e-file by... September 30th. Now, I know that this right now is a really quick and easy way for me to do a memo. Now, the next thing that for some of us, this could seem pretty low tech. 
we realized that it's made it very simple to go ahead and create a standardized template. Where is it that I'm going to get those templates? How do I put them in there? And I'm actually going to show you in just a second. The other thing I'd like to talk a little bit more about from a customizing work perspective is our quick access toolbar, how we customize that. And I'm even going to show you the, I think, super neat way to import and export those settings in a super simple way. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to press save. Now, notice that when I go ahead and do this, you'll notice that a dialog box comes up. This dialog box happens to be for a tool called SharePoint for Legal. This could also be the box that would be for Open Text or Docs Open or Worksite. So whatever it is that you are going to save into, and in this case, I'm going to go ahead and find the Evans matter, and I'm going to go ahead and put this in the correspondence matter. Again, very similar stuff that what we're used to seeing. And I'm going to call it Memo 2, J. Dwight, and press OK. And in this case, again, this is another little area that my document management system tries to help us. Again, notice that the template saved in just as easily as a Word document would have been had I started it from file new. So again, not something that will take away from all the efforts that you've made for your content. Let's talk a little bit about where those locations are. I'm going to go ahead and just come down here on the file men menu. And for those of us maybe using Office 2007, it, the Office button may look like a big circle. File nonetheless, and all you're going to go ahead and look for in that case is the options area. And I'm going to move this box down so everyone can see. On the options area, I'm going to move over to advanced. And remember we were talking about where is it that I can put my templates that I've created and administered. Now, if you're in a networked environment, which I would expect that you would be, your locations might be a little different than the ones that are set up by Microsoft as the default. No problem. The best part is you can actually go ahead and prevent folks from creating their own templates if you wanted to using group policy. So all I'm doing here for anything that's in my file new from template directory is simply popping right over here, and it happens to be looking in this particular directory, in which case you can see that there really aren't a whole lot there, and that's because this is not, um, I don't have mine set up in the same way that you might want to at your own firm. Also, as an example, each folder inside of this will give each different layer, if you will, on the file new box. So all California templates could be in one folder. One of the other things that you'll notice right below in Word options from our advanced options is our ability to customize not only the ribbon, but the quick access toolbar. The ribbon can be customized right from here, and not a lot of folks know that in order to add a new tab, and you'll notice that my Dwight and Harrison tab is right here, I can tell that it's the one I created because it says custom. When I go ahead and press this plus, I can see that there are different commands that I have decided to add underneath that. So before I was talking about the insert a section break, and any of us in the legal community know that for some reason, Microsoft moved that button off the insert area. And I'm not sure why. But maybe my help desk gets called with that a lot. How can I help my user community? Well, I can either add it to my quick access toolbar, which I can do right from here, or I can add it right to that custom ribbon area that I created. If I wanted to add it to this custom spot, all I need to do, and for insert a section break, happens to be one of those ones that hides out. You need to go to the All Commands button. And unfortunately or fortunately, you get to scroll down just a shade here and find our friend, the Insert Section Break. Stay with me just a moment. And I can add that right to that box. And I can move it up or move it down as I see fit. Pretty neat, right? I'm going to notice right here that I have two areas, one that I can reset my QAT or Quick Access Toolbar, and one that I can import or export my changes. So if you created a firm standard, you let your users go ahead and pop a couple buttons in there. Ring, ring, help desk, I lost my QAT, no problem. If you have a firm standard to reset to, you can go ahead and make it easier for your users to do whatever it is that makes their lives easier with Microsoft. 
So I can go ahead and import or change, export, or reset any of these buttons and to rename anything, it's super simple in here. And again, my quick access toolbar is located here. One thing that some folks don't realize about the quick access toolbar is that you can add a button to it simply by going and right clicking right on top of any button. Notice that qu add to quick access toolbar is right there. A lot of times people feel like they need to go ahead and do what I like to call around the world to the left to find the proper command when all it is is right there. And we'll talk about how to find commands and things like that in just a moment. But what I wanted to do first is now that I saved my brief, or excuse me, my memo, we talked a little bit about why does my quick access toolbar look a little different maybe than yours does. Oh, and I have one last thing about the quick access toolbar. You'll notice that I can, and I'm going to right click on that gray area. Notice that I can show my quick access toolbar above the ribbon as well. Word of caution to those of us using document management systems. They tend to put in the title bar of the document, the document number and name. So some of your users might find it difficult and even in the way if you go ahead and put it up toward the top. Just again, a little word to the wise. From folks that have been doing this for a lot of years, we found that to be the case. So now that we went ahead and we saved our, uh, we saved our memo in, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to come right over and I'm going to minimize my, um, I'm going, actually no, I think I might close my, my letter, or my memo rather. And you'll notice that what I'm going to do now is email it over to one of my colleagues for review. And this is one of the things I think that I know attorneys spend a lot of time sending, emailing documents, if you will, all around. Whether they're documents, they're from a DMS, they're from their hard drive, they're sending links perhaps from SkyDrive, no matter what, we tend to spend a lot of time reviewing documents together. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and attach my file. Then there happens to become my letter, or excuse me, my memo to Mr. Dwight. And I'm going to go ahead and send that out. Now, you'll notice that this little box comes up. Again, this is a function of my document management system. Those of us that are used to what's known as a send and file technology will be familiar with that, if you will. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and press send and get my email and attachment out. Now, the reason that I'm sending the email and attachment over to Anne is because Ann happens to be John's assistant. And maybe Ann is one of those, uh, John's one of those folks who uses his paralegal to go ahead and review uh, documents before they get up to that level. Now, as you know, I just emailed that document over to Ann, but you know, one of the ways that Microsoft can help us really go ahead and work together, especially with some folks that may not even be in the same department as us, or maybe even in a different location, is to go ahead and use a tool called Microsoft Link. Now, Microsoft Link is a little different in the sense that, oops. Okay. Microsoft Link is actually located right here. And I hope everybody can see that on my screen. I'm gonna make it nice and big. Now, my Microsoft link is set up here at MicroStrategies to help me work better with different colleagues in different places. Now, the person that I had emailed is Anne, and we noticed by just looking that Anne is currently busy, and that's okay, because we're going to see if Anne could work with us to go ahead and look at a document together. So the first thing that I'm going to do is note, well, I look and see that she's busy and she's not free until 3 o'clock. What's that mean? That means that Microsoft Presence, which is actually a function of Link and Outlook, can tell whether or not someone on the corporate IM, if you will, is available. How can you tell? Because that individual's calendar is actually displayed via Link on whether or not somebody is away, like Aaron is. In this case, he might have stepped away from his computer or if Allison, in this case, is available. We see that Anne is busy, and when we go ahead and touch her picture, we can see that there's a multitude of ways that we can contact her. One is, of course, that we can email her. We can also send her an instant message. We can even call Anne using our link technology. And finally, we can go ahead and have even more options. 
But for right now, I'm just going to go ahead and see, is Anne too busy to go ahead and review this document with me? So I'm going to say, hello, Anne. Now, I know that it says Anne is busy. And just because it says Anne is busy doesn't mean that it won't come up. I'm sure you're thinking then, well, Kristen, you're on here doing a demonstration, and I'm sure people are asking and, and not listening to you, not please don't bother me, and that's actually a great point. If there's ever a time where you would like to be uh, in a do not disturb mode, you can go and simply override your setting by coming right here and selecting do not disturb. It's also great when you're out of office, vacation announcement comes up because we can see whether or not somebody is on vacation simply by scrolling down and seeing, well, that person won't be available um, until perhaps next week. So there we see that Anne is there. And I think about whether or not that I would want to go ahead and work with Anne on our document. And we can go ahead and, and you'll see on my screen that Anne and I are actually able to chat right here. But how could we kick it up a notch? Anne might even be in our California office, and I'm here in New Jersey. How is it that I can go ahead and chat with Anne on a video conference? Very simply, right here from my link box, I can pop right up. And as a matter of fact, before I even do that, maybe I'd like to go ahead and look at the document that we're going to review together. And maybe Anne and I should review the same document. So the first thing I do is I bring up the document on my screen. And you'll recognize this is the memo that we had worked on before. And I'm going to pop right over. Notice that I can even force Blink, by the way, to stay on top of all my applications if it's easier. But in this case, I'm actually going to keep it here. And the next thing I'm going to do is say, well, you know what? I'd really like to share my screen with Anne. And in Microsoft Link terminology, that means share my desktop. When I show my desktop, Anne can actually see the same exact screen that I have as well. And when I can go, and she can even go so far as to request control of my screen. So if she wanted to be the person to scroll up or down or even perhaps make an edit to our document, it's no problem. And we can do this together. So you, as I'm sure you can imagine, that chat is a great way of being able to see, and Anne can go ahead is accepting, if you notice. Anne's actually asking if she can drive on my computer. And I'm going to tell her, sure, no problem. What this allows Anne to do is that she can actually go ahead, and I'm sitting here talking to you. Anne, who is a remote user, who happens to be in our LA department, if you will, is going ahead and typing on the memo. Thank you so much. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, maybe I would be on the phone with Anne at the same time, but how can we again address this in the 21st century? We can have a video chat. How do we do that? Well, very simply, I'm going to go right back to my link box and bring up my chat with Anne, except that right now, instead of having just a document up, we can also have the document up at a video. We add the video. And we'll wait for Anne to go ahead and start hers. And it just takes one second for us to get that nice uh, flow through all of our different types of information that we're going ahead. Notice that I have a pause button here. And in this case, please do note that my speaker on my internal computer is noted is muted, and that's because I want to be sure not to cause any feedback with our audio from today, which is something that I'm sure the WebEx folks are quite thrilled with. Now, it seems like Anne's computer is just not being too cooperative when it comes to sharing the video, and that's okay. Oh, and there she goes. She's muted, actually, as well as one of our participants, but that's no problem. Now, I want you to see that not only do I get to see Anne's smiling face, which is great when it comes to putting a face with a name, especially for those of us that work with folks in different departments that could be really far away. So Anne and I actually can not only carry on a conversation face-to-face, -face, which is very nice, but we can also look at the same document at the same time. Oops. So, and there she is. Hi, Anne. How are you? Hi, Kristen. Good. How are you? 
Fantastic. So we are bridging the miles, not even talking about the differences in how one of the ways that the technology has made it hard for us to work together as people, this helps bridge that gap. Now let's say that we might even have one more person that could be very valuable to our conversation. How is it that we would add that person? Well, it's super easy again. All I'm going to do is bring up my little link, link box right here. I'm going to scoot down and see, oh, is the person that I'm looking for ready up? Uh, Anne's not sure if, I'm not sure if Leanne's in. Oh, there she is. And Leanne happens to be in, in a meeting, but we know that what we're doing is so much cooler than whatever she's doing. <laughs> All I need to do to add Leanne to this particular call is drag and drop her. And now, give it one second, even if Leanne does not have the ability to get on a webcam with us, it's no problem. She can also see the document that we're all preparing together, and we can all collaborate. This is, again, one of the ways that Microsoft today lets us be able to go ahead and do all of the things that we can do in a room together online. And I will tell you, one of the things that Anne and Leanne and I love to do together, besides viewing and reviewing documents, is to brainstorm together. And the way that we do a brainstorm in the 21st century link is a whiteboard. How do I go ahead and do a whiteboard? Well, another great question. What I'm going to do is simply go ahead, and I'm going to create a whiteboard to share. And I'm going to do this. OK. Oh. Look, it seems that somebody didn't listen and asked when I had my do not disturb on and sent me a text or an IM anyway. If that happens, I can simply go right ahead and I'll notice whatever somebody had mentioned to me or if they IM me while I was in a do not disturb or maybe I didn't get back to my computer fast enough are all located right here. So it's very easy to be able to go ahead and use. So in order to create a whiteboard, what I'm going to do is simply pop right over here and say new whiteboard. And again, notice that we not only have a whiteboard, and we're going to give it just a moment. These can actually also be prepared in advance if you are going to be reviewing something in particular. So Leanne happens to be our marketing person, and marketing people love to come up with ideas. So what we're going to do is open the floor to Anne, Leanne, or myself. Oh, does anybody have any great marketing ideas? And of course, I know somebody's going to have to come up and say, Ilta, I'm sure somebody else is going to want to add. Notice that no matter who is the person typing, that all of us are collaborating in the same whiteboard. And notice somebody is actually using the pen. I was going ahead and typing. And you can even go ahead and, if you'd like to, using the laser pointer to say who actually had typed something in particular. I can also use an arrow to go ahead and make my point. Now, I'm sure that this is, again, a collaboration tool that allows us to bring that war room mentality of a whiteboard to the collaboration that is online in the 21st century. Now, from this perspective, you might think, well, you know what? I just worked an awful long time on this. Maybe we've captured some great ideas, and Leanne and I have worked really hard. What can I do? I can always scoot down and save this whiteboard with any notes that happen to be on it right in, as an XPS file. And for those who are not familiar with an XPS file, all XPS files mean is portable document format, meaning that it will keep all of the book and feel no matter what kind of application or operating system opens the file. So as I'm sure you can imagine, this file can also be saved right back into the DMS if you'd like to keep all of the matter or project files together, you can find them. So this could be my white board from 723. And I can go ahead and press Save. And now my whiteboard has been saved. I can go ahead and actually go back later and be able to come back and refer to that whiteboard again or use it for another use. So today, we've talked a lot about all the different ways no matter where we are on the roadmap of how to go ahead and get our firms or our corporations, legal departments, up to the 21st century. How can we do that? What tools might we already own? Or are we going to probably own in the near future that can help us bridge the gap 
between how we do business and how we do business in the 21st century. Today we talked about Office 2010, a little bit about Outlook. We spent some time in Word talking about making templates standardized across the firm or the company. We talked about making a quick access toolbar accessible for all different groups across or even using a custom ribbon bar that the IT department can import or export any way that they'd like. Administration in this case is key. Finally, we rounded today's session out talking a little bit more about Microsoft collaboration tools for 2012. We used Link to work with one of our colleagues who happens to be in a different location today. We have also used Link to create a whiteboarding session and include even another person from our firm into our whiteboarding session. And we are here, last but not least, to take any questions that folks may have. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, no matter where it is that we're coming from on the roadmap, we're all going to the same place, which is collaboration for the 21st century on the Microsoft platform. So with that, I'd very much like to uh, find out if there are any questions that were asked. Jennifer? Yes, we do have a few questions in queue here. And the first one is, um, yes, uh, I saw you corresponding with, via link with Anne. Is there a record of those messages so that I can refer to them? That's actually a great question. Um, it's actually, it's available in two places, and one of which I sort of alluded to, and I'm going to go ahead and just minimize this for just a second. Oops. Um, so we have two spots where any link conversation is controlled, and one of those places is actually inside of link. Before when I had gone and I had a missed conversation when I pressed that button, not only does it remember my missed conversations, but it will also remember, remember all of my conversation history. The other place that I can go is actually, I think, even better, which is inside of Outlook. Inside of Outlook, actually, you might not have even noticed, has a small little area called conversation history. So that will allow you to go ahead and see all of the conversations that you have throughout any day. And you saw how it was able to save whiteboard papers, no problem. Thank you. Now, in the demo, you showed DMS for legal. Whose product is that? And what other vendors are out there? And do you work with them, too? Actually, um, Again, another great question. Today's demo actually showcases a solution called ePona, DMS for legal. That happens to sit on top of a SharePoint 2010 installation. Of course we work with other vendors. In particular, we work with MacroView, and we've also a partner with Work SharePoint. So both of those other folks have DMS type solutions that sit on top of SharePoint. From another perspective, we know after 28 years of being in the same place with the same phone number, there are many best-in-class content management solutions for legal, including Worksite, as well as Docs Open or Open Text. And we're able to work with all of them. Thank you. And if I am currently running Autonomy and I have SharePoint, is there something I can do? Again, great question. <clears throat> As we know, Autonomy, specifically Worksite, but along with some other best-in-class solutions, have been used in corporate legal as well as law firms for a long time. We are able, if you would like, to continue to use those third-party solutions from those other vendors and help you use them for your content management needs, either in your corporation level or at your firm. If you're looking toward more of a platform type of a solution or an ecological solution such as SharePoint, we're happy to help with that too, and we have partners from that side of the world as well. I hope that answers your question. Sounds perfect. Thank now, you. Another question being, are many law firms going to SharePoint as a DMS solution? Why and why not? Again, fantastic question. And the answer is many firms are going toward SharePoint or are starting to look at SharePoint. And from the market perspective, we've seen a significant increase in the number of firms 
and corporate legal departments, and in particular corporate legal departments, looking at SharePoint as a possible solution. And the reasons for this are actually many fold. In particular, SharePoint, like I mentioned before, is an ecological solution, meaning that SharePoint, just like parts of the Microsoft Solutions package, like SQL, for example, are installed on an enterprise level, meaning that the central IT department would install it and maybe make some configurations for the folks over in the compliance department or the legal department, as an example. That part, the way that attorneys, and in particular legal users, and I know that I speak with those of them that are listening, we have very particular requirements when it comes to document management. We have very particular needs when it comes to putting document IDs in footers, as an example, or being able to take documents and have versions, major or minor. It is only now, over the past, I would say, six months to a year, that third-party solutions for a robust legal document management system have only come to light, I would say, over the past six months. We are seeing a huge upswing in the number of corporate legal departments looking to be good corporate citizens by installing a SharePoint install, but then customizing it or configuring it specifically for legal users. And again, this is something that those requirements really haven't been met until now. But that's an awesome question. Thank you. Thank you. Now, another question. Our firm is currently running Office 2003, and we are trying to decide if we should go to Office 2010 or Office 365, or wait for the new release of Office 2015. Can you give us some pointers? Wow, and waiting into 2015, and I can remember there are probably folks listening to this today that thought in 2007 or 2006, do we start, do we go now, do we wait for 2007, do we wait for 2010? And I understand that there are a lot of reasons that some of us might actually still be using Office XP or Office 2003. A couple of things that I want to let you know, based on what we found out at the Microsoft Partner Conference, is that they are going to be ending the life, meaning they will no longer support, even from a hot fix perspective, Office 2003 or Office XP. Now, that should send shutters down the backs of every IT person listening, because not only will they not even up, uh, hot fix you, but you will actually are going to have to buy a special support contract in the upwards of 25K just to be able to get hot fixes. So if there was ever an impetus ever to get off of the old software, I beg the question. The answer is please think about it now. Now, I understand that Office 2007 came out and our community was reticent to accept these changes, mostly in my mind because Outlook didn't look snazzy enough yet. Outlook didn't have the Office button until 2010. And with 2010 came an architectural shift in the way that we deal with macros came an architectural shift in the way that we deal with files, and it's also enabled us to use a lot of the really neat parts about Microsoft, like that presence we talked about, like the embedded metadata inside of a Word document. Now, I suppose you could wait until 2015, but please be aware that that support for 2003 is going to get cut off a year before that. Now, the other part of that question, Jen, that I heard you ask, actually had a little bit to do with Office 365. And I know that that's, it's on the minds of a lot of us in the legal community. And what Office 365 is, is pretty much the way for a firm or even a smaller corporation to get Exchange, SharePoint, and Link services all hosted. What does that mean? No worries about infrastructure. And you can also go ahead and pop Office 2010 right on top of it. So if you have an add-in for Outlook, aside from it being tested, no problem, right to the cloud. Is that a solution that will work for a major corporation or for a law firm that has very low, uh, perhaps uh, that's really not keeping a bunch of things from a uh, disaster recovery perspective? Probably not. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea about where the road signs might be for your firm, and if you'd like more information about upgrading your particular firm and the kinds of solutions you already have in place and where you'd like to see yourself going, then please don't hesitate to come over and talk to us at ILTA 
or that we can go ahead and schedule a demo with us at ILTA to be able to see how it would play out in your environment. Thank you, Jen. That sounds great. Thank now, you. another question being in, um, what key things would you advise for an Office 2010 upgrade in a law office? Well, and I think that that's, and, and thank you to whoever asked this question because it's, it provides me a, a great time to recap what we talked about today. And the reason that I wanted to do that, and we talked a little bit about making standardized templates. We talked a little bit about making a quick access toolbar. We talked a lot about training and support, going out to our user communities. Hey, what do you guys need? What do you have trouble? Maybe we're going to go look at the, con the current help desk tickets. We're going to see people keep calling and asking us about these things. What I showed today, in my mind, are low-tech ways and low-resource sucking ways, if you will, for us to give our users a complete experience to make more adoption. Again, for any more information about any of that, please don't hesitate to reach out. But that would be one of the best ways to start thinking about Office 2010 is, what can I customize? What can I bring forward for my users? How can I get them educated and excited? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we do have just two more questions showing here. Oh, we heard great, because I know we're rounding out in eight minutes. <laughs> we heard the recent announcement about Windows 8. We just upgraded to Windows 7. What happens to us now? Oh, now this is, this, and, and this is the story from the IT perspective of the cat and the mouse. Because we all get to upgrade. I know a lot of us are at Office 2010, and we're starting to think about this now, too. We got to Windows 7. Oh, my gosh, we just heard something. Steve Ballmer brought out Windows 8. How does this change on everything? The answer is it doesn't. And I want you to know from an IT perspective, we learned at the partner conference that Windows 7 is the standard gold standard for desktops. And while new great applications and interesting bits will be coming out for Windows 8, that these things probably won't filter down, I'm thinking, into the corporate world for quite a while. So in the meantime, Windows 7 is the gold standard, and don't worry, we are all here to support it. And you said a last question, Jen. I do have one last one here. Awesome. Very and good. It's kind of a statement and then a question, okay? Oh. I love the link. How can Ooh, I, exciting. I, so I can too. sell this to my partners? Heck yeah, and I'm guessing whoever wrote that question would like to sell it to the partners at the firm. And I don't blame you. One of the ways that MicroStrategies consistently provides value is helping you load your gun with the silver bullet that will get the buy-in from your executive committee so you can get the technology for tomorrow. And I'm so glad to hear that you love Link. I love Link too, and I couldn't wait to show it to you today. One of the best parts about this link is that we've partnered with Microsoft and we'll be offering demos at our own booth, ILTA booth number 112. So if you want to stop by, check out link, see what a video conference might look like, please don't hesitate to contact me at legal at microstrategies.com or on LinkedIn, and we are happy to set up a demo for you either on site at the MEC or over at ILTA. But we're... I can, personally cannot get enough link, and I can tell you when folks in the line of businesses that you all support see that they can finally put a face with a name and they can collaborate effectively across the miles, it is a showstopper, as I'm sure you've enjoyed it today, and thank you so much for the compliment. All right, and it, we did have a couple more questions come in, but we are out of time for further questions. So if we didn't address your question, we will follow up with you following this session. I'd just like to hand it back to you, Kristen, for any final remarks. Again, I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming today. I am greatly appreciative of your time. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Once again, this is Kristen Graber. My last name and my email address is K-G-R-A as in Adam, E as in Edward, B as in boy, E-R, at microstrat.com. If you'll be at ILTA, please don't hesitate to stop by our booth 2012. I will be there, and I will be able to show you anything you'd like to know about Link or any of the other technologies we've spoken about today. And actually, as a matter of fact, we're at booth 1128. As a matter of fact, the marketing folks are definitely full of ideas for me now, I'm sure. But we will be there. If you would like to reach out ahead of time, please do not hesitate to contact us. 
at legal at microstrat.com or 888-GHOST-SOLUTIONS. Thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to seeing you at ILSA. Bye-bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for attending, and have a wonderful afternoon.